our experience with life is frequently that it's very complex. When we're young, we're often told that there's a simple choice between what is right and what is wrong. But as we begin to go through life and experience different elements, different choices, different uh, people who are telling us to do different things, we begin to realize that everything's not so black and white. We've talked about this before. Life is just complex. But I think what the Father is trying to do, and this specific lesson here, is to try to almost reduce our choices, again, back down to just two. We're choosing between the good and the bad. We're choosing between the right path and the wrong path. And in fact, I think if, if we're to label this lesson here, lesson number six, we would just call it the two paths. It seems the father is telling the son, I, I know that life is complex. I know that there's a lot of choices that you face out there, and I know that as you come up um, on, these, on these forks in the road or as you come up on these decisions, there will be difficulty in knowing what to do, how to assess the situation and make the right decision. But what the Father seems to be suggesting here is that there is a good path, there is a right way, and, and it's actually not that hard to know how to stay on it. There is a wicked path. And it's, it's full of bad things and it's full of, of bad choices. And actually, it's not that hard to know when you're on the evil path or the wicked path or the rotten path. And so the father's words to the son here are to really, I think, kind of simplify things a bit and help him know which path to choose. And so he begins in his introduction here, just one verse, verse 10 of chapter 4 by talking about what wisdom does. He says, listen, my son, accept my words and you will live many years. He makes it very simple, right? You just take what I'm saying, you listen to what I have to say, and you'll live many years. He's trying to create, I think, an attitude of receptivity. And what he seems to be suggesting is that there's actually a spiral here. If you will choose to take the path of wisdom, if you will choose to sort of step on this one road, what you'll find is that wisdom will help keep you there. You make wise choices, and those wise choices will benefit you, which will help you want to make more wise choices, and those wise choices will benefit you, which will then help you want to make even more wise choices. And round and round and round we go. In other words, if you will choose wisdom, you will find that it's a beneficial spiral. You choose wisdom's path, and wisdom will help you remain on it. The father is giving his son his experience here. This is what I have found, it seems he says, in my life. You choose wisdom, and it will give you many years of life. In order to help him understand this lesson, though, he introduces a few characters. He talks about, I think, the wicked and the righteous. The wicked are, of course, those who take the bad path. However, the righteous are those who take wisdom's path. We will meet both of them as we continue on in the journey. He says, verse 11, I am teaching you the way of wisdom. I am guiding you on straight paths. The word for teaching here is related to the word show. In fact, that's kind of what it means. I am showing you the way of wisdom. Teaching often looks like showing, especially, I think, in the Old Testament. Frequently, teaching, as it occurs throughout the Old Testament, is is not just sitting in a classroom trying to learn from someone, but rather it's someone showing or demonstrating to someone what they are supposed to do. Other forms of instruction include helping someone experience the negative consequences of what they've done. They can experience sort of the the bad side of this, or or this is what happens when you make this choice. But the word here is less of helping you experience the, the negative consequences, and it is more of, let me show you what this looks like. And here, what the father is trying to do is is sort of paint a a, a detailed picture for the son in order that the son might be able to understand what it's like to go on the way of wisdom, to go on this single path of wisdom. He says, I am guiding 
you. And the word he uses for guide is related to this word for walk or tread on a path. In fact, the word for path is related to this verb. The same letters that occur in the word for path are found in this verb. And the idea, I think, is, is the Father is saying, let me help you tread on this path. Let me help you walk on this straight path. I think the metaphor, if we're going to sort of put a metaphor over this section, it's life is a journey. We're talking about life as a journey, and because of that, we can begin to talk about the path that wisdom takes you on. He says in verse 12, when you walk, your steps will not be hindered. When you run, you will not stumble. In other words, as you go about your life, you will find that there is great freedom of movement. You're able to go this way. Uh, as, as you as you walk down the path of wisdom, you'll be able to go this way without any real problems whatsoever. Job 18 verse 7, Bildad is, is talking to Job and he says that the wicked's path will shorten his strong steps. I think what that means is that he's going to have difficulty walking. The, the farther he goes, it's going to be all sorts of rocks or, or obstacles along the way. He's going to stumble along the way, but not so the path of the righteous. Psalm 18, verse 36, David says, you gave a wide place for my steps under me. In other words, this is what it's like to live the good path, the good life, to take the good path along the way that wisdom is laying out for you. As you walk, you will find it easy, you're to, uh, easy to step. And in fact, even if you run, the writer of Proverbs says, you will not stumble. This path is just a better path. So you hold on to instruction, verse 13, don't let go. This word uh, here for instruction is discipline, right? You guard this, you keep it, uh, for she is your life. Who is this that is your life? I think it's this idea of wisdom, right? It, she, is your life. Wisdom is your life. So how do you protect? How do you guard? How do you hold on to discipline? or correction. How do you do that? Well, I think you do it by taking the care needed to maintain it. This then requires some sort of active response on our part. So often we think about our learning as a passive experience. We go, we sit in the classroom, and we just learn. Maybe you just watch a video where someone else teaches you, and you learn. But part of education, it seems, involves us being willing to hear the words and put them into practice. It actually takes some sort of active engagement on our part in order to be able to hold on to it or, or keep it or guard it ourselves. And so what the Father tells the Son here is make sure that you hold on to this, guard it, keep it, for it is your life. He says in verse 14, keep off the pack path of the wicked. Don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Avoid it. Don't travel on it, turn away from it, and pass it by. So you stay on the path along with the righteous. However, you avoid the path of the wicked. In fact, in verses 14 and 15 here, we have six different commands or imperatives that enforce the point. The first two advocate avoiding the path of evil people. And I think that's because evil people don't always seem evil. Frequently, we encounter people who might be evil or who might have malicious intent, and we just don't know it. We encounter them and they seem kind enough or nice enough or gentle enough or wise enough. And so we choose to go along with them. We listen to their voice and, and so quickly we find ourselves associated with them. But what the father is instructing the children here is you keep away. You stay away from the path of the wicked altogether. You don't proceed on the way of evil ones. Perhaps this doesn't help us when it comes to meeting someone. Are we meeting someone who is, who, who is good or bad? Are we meeting someone who is making wise choices or poor choices? Maybe we have a harder time discerning that, but we can make some quick decisions. We can make some quick judgments about whether the path they're bringing us on is a path of righteousness or a path of wickedness. So he says, avoid it. Don't travel on it. Turn away from it and pass it by. Avoid it 
no matter what, I think is what the Father is saying. There really is an interesting theme throughout all of these uh, uh, all of these lessons in Proverbs chapters one through nine of refusing to even step onto the path of the wicked. Frequently, we may find ourselves in difficult situations, or we may be coming alongside of others who find themselves in difficult situations. And what the the difficulty often is is that we're faced with a, a really tough decision. We're faced with a choice between what we know is good and what we know is bad, and and, and it find, we find it really difficult to resist the temptation. It seems that the theme that runs through these first nine chapters of Proverbs is don't put yourself in the situation to begin with. You just keep your feet off of the wicked path, and you'll find that the temptation doesn't present itself nearly as strongly as it would is as if you were there walking along that road, right? I think we all have learned in life that if we want to avoid temptation, if we can avoid the situations where temptations present themselves, then we won't be tempted as much as we would be otherwise. And so this is the father's warning for the children. Now he gives us a little bit more information about those who travel on the path of the wicked, those who are consumed with wickedness and evil. He says, verse 16, they can't sleep unless they have done what is evil. They are robbed of sleep unless they make someone stumble. In other words, sleep is stolen from them until they've stolen from someone else. And this, I think, we talked before about the beneficial spiral. This, I think, is the negative spiral. In other words, you do wicked, and then that wickedness will cause you to do more wickedness. And you can't stop. They don't steal to live. They live to steal, it seems. So they steal, and it makes them want to steal more. And so they steal more. And then that makes them want to steal more. And so they steal more. And down and down and down this spiral goes, we continue on this path of the wicked. The danger for the son is falling prey to the wicked. He, if he is too ignorant, if the son is too ignorant of what he's doing, he's going to find that his path is merging with theirs. And the reality is, maybe he feels like these are just friends, right? We think back to Proverbs chapter 1 and the enticement of the crowd. Come, come along with us. Why don't you throw in your lot with us? We'll, we'll have one common, uh, we'll have one common pot, all of us together. We'll, we'll share the prophets. And the father says, don't do that. Don't even go down with them uh, because they're actually lying awake for their own blood. What the father is saying to the sons here is that if you aren't careful, you'll find yourself with the wicked, but the wicked are out to destroy you. They want to take your life. They're out to steal from you. And so maybe it feels like they're just wanting you to come and join with them. They just want you to be their friend. They want you to be their, their, their companion along the path. But he says, no, <laughs> it's an unwise choice because they're actually after your life. They can't, they can't sleep until they've stolen and you will be the one that they steal from. And he says in verse 17, they eat the bread of wickedness and they drink the wine of violence. In other words, their sustenance, the things that they eat and drink on a regular basis are wickedness and violent acts. In the ancient world, uh, it's very, very likely that wine was more common than water. In some places, if they didn't have easy access to wells, then they would rely on, on the, the fermented uh, process that produ produced this uh, grape wine that they would drink. And I think this was a very common drink in ancient Israel. People are, are regularly drinking this. This is just the, your regular sustenance of, um, of quenching your thirst. You drink wine. At the same time, bread becomes really the, the basic sustenance of life. Every day, it seems, uh, the women would sit around in a circle and they would have their grinding stones and they would grind out the grain for use each day. Uh, it seems that this was a, a common practice in ancient Israel that the, the women in the town would gather together. They've actually found in several villages uh, or uh, what seemed like early Israelite settlements that uh, there's uh, um, uh, remnants of grinding stones kind of in a, a circle form. And it seems that the, the women would sit around with one another. And by some estimates, people think that they would spend about two hours every day to grind enough 
grain or enough wheat for uh, bread to be provided for a family of four. In other words, just for your small family, if you're trying to provide for them, you would sit together with, with the other people in the circle. You would grind for two hours in order to make enough flour that you could be able to use to make bread. And so, uh, because it seems that this was something that the women engaged in, this became a circle of sorts in which, which they would provide for their family when, and, and by, by which they might pass around the news of the community. But this was a part of daily life. And so much so that, that bread becomes a way of talking about this is, this is the way we live. It's such an essential part of life that this is the way that we uh, provide for one another by, by providing bread. This is the main thing that we eat. And so these individuals who are on this wicked path, they're drinking the wine, but it's violence. They're eating their bread, but it's wickedness. And so the idea is, is this is all they're consuming. This is their regular sustenance of life is these evil things. And if you find yourself on the path with them, you won't be eating the good bread produced by mom, uh, who that, that, that brings uh, uh, health and life to the family. Or the good wine, right, that was harvested in your own vineyards by your family, right? No, this instead is, is the bread of wickedness, the wine of violence, and it leads you to death. And so verses 18 and 19 really is a summary of where we've been. It says this, The path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, shining brighter and brighter until midday. The wicked and the righteous here are contrasted with this metaphor of light. And light is a metaphor frequently in the, uh, in the Bible, really in the Old Testament, uh, is, is where we see this uh, become such a significant piece. Light is what happens when God shows up. Light is actually, remember, God's very first words, right? Let there be light. And it seems that light is this metaphor for God's presence, God's goodness throughout all of Scripture. And so those who are on the path of the righteous will find that they're living in light. They're living in the light of God's presence even. And it will shine brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. Again, this cycle that is beneficial, that's good, that is what is life, that is what life is like on the path of the righteous. But the way of the wicked, verse 19, is like the darkest gloom, and they don't even know what makes them stumble. So the wicked will find themselves living in darkness. They have turned away from the light of God's face, and so they don't experience any light as they go on their journey. And as they're on their crooked path, their, their path that takes them towards destruction, they find themselves stumbling and they don't even know why. And so the choice for the children is at the beginning. The choice comes when you have to choose which path to take. As your life path forks in two, you can choose the path of the righteous or you can choose the path of the wicked. And I think what the father is trying to encourage the sons with here is to choose life. I know maybe life seems complex. I know it may seem that, that it's not always just a choice between what is good and what is bad, but I think the Father is saying, no, it really is. It really is. Will you choose to align yourself with wisdom? Will you choose to turn away from the path of the wicked? Will you choose life that is the good path? This is the way you should go. Walk in it. <laughs>